later on you can convert it and get it published. But mine was the, the opposite. Mm. I had a contract from Random House to write the book, even before I got to State University of New York, the American Studies program. So I was there, I was writing the book for Random House. So when, it, when I finished the book, Random House published it, and there was some, I think, some bureaucratic delay because it was a new program. So whereas the administration was waiting to do whatever they were doing, I had to go back and say, look, I have to move on. I can't be waiting for this. So that was when I went back and talked to the relevant deans and told them, look, here's my dissertation. It's been published. Where's my PhD? <laughs> and they gave it to you? Well, it was already been approved. There's no, it was just that it was stuck in the pipeline, the bureaucratic pipeline. Oh, okay. So at that point, they had to hurry up and give it to me, <laughs> dig it up from wherever it was. <laughs> But the title of that, it has a very long title, so permit me, I have to read it, became The West and the Rest of Us, White Predators, Black Slaves and the Rest of Us. Did I get Black that Black Slavers. Black Slavers yeah. and the Rest of Us. That's a very long title for a book. Well, this title is The West and the Rest of Us. That, the rest is a subtitle. Okay. And what was the core message that you sought to put out in this particular book? Well, the basic issue is, at that point in the history of the world, the world was divided between the West and everybody else, mm. hence the West and the rest of us. So what the book was trying to do was to explore the relationship between the West and the rest of us in the world. And the subtitle had to deal with the particular relationship between us and the West going back to the period of the Maafa or the so-called transatlantic slave trade. Mm. You had the white slave traders, you had the blacks enslavers who facilitated their job. So basically, I was drawing attention to the relationship which still continues between the West and the black elites of today. They are no different from those of the slaving era. You don't think there's been a change, there's been improvement in the relationships? Well, I'll give you an example of the improvement. In that period, the whites came to sell us trinkets, mm -hmm. gunpowder, and um, pots and pans. Now they sell us SUVs, they sell us um, hummers, they sell us all kinds of new gadgets. The essential relationship remains the same. They set the prices for everything we buy. We can't even set the prices for what we sell them because they control the international markets. So that has not changed. And my point is that until we change that relationship, our situation is not going to, it's not going to improve in the world. All the people who have developed themselves in the world have done so by tackling that relationship and changing it. So that is something that your generation has to begin to face up to that if you want to improve your situation of black people in the world, yeah. you must pay attention to the essential relationship in which we are caught, caught up and we've been trapped in for over five centuries. If you don't pay attention to that, you can bluster, condemn the imperialists, do whatever you like, but you'll be stuck where you are. But you've also said that for Africa to thrive and get to where you are talking about, we should have stripped away all colonial structures and rebuilt our own. Was that feasible? I think the question is, if you, is this what needs to be done? But how, 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 how can that be done when the people who led that fight were almost all, all trained from the West, basically? Well, that's one view of the matter. It doesn't matter where you were trained. Does that not influence you? It does influence you, but the question is, all kinds of things influence you, but you've got to know where you are going. And if you know where you are going, you can take whatever opportunities come your way to get to where you want to go. The people who got us so-called independence, they are well trained in the West. So too were the people who created the Korean example, transformation of Korea or Singapore, they were well trained in the West. 
So that is not the issue. You have to figure out why did they do what they did, and your people didn't do what they what they should have done, and then what do you still need to do? What do you still need to do to get yourself out of your mess? When you approach the problem in a practical manner, then that you are trained in the West doesn't become an obstacle. People trained in the West can adapt and use the knowledge they got from the West to solve their own problems. So we don't necessarily have to strip everything away. Well, let's put it this way. Autonomous societies, when they want to transform, start from the base of what they have mm -hmm. and then take elements that they find useful from everywhere else and add on to it. The example of, say, Japan mm -hmm. in the Meiji era illustrates that because they had a Japanese culture and society and when they were shaken awake to the fact that they had to modernize, they went and brought people from everywhere to, and learned from them and revealed Japan as a modern society. Our main difference is that we don't have autonomy anymore. So uh, we, are, we are independent. Almost every country on the continent is independent. Yeah. That's, um, what should I call it, flag, and flag independence. Who runs your countries? African leaders. Right? They are black face fronts for, your, for, for those who run your country. You do not believe that these are people who are running the country for Africans, nope. on nope. African values, nope. on African philosophies? Nope. You they don't not. believe so? I can show you that they are not. Show me. Okay, fine. Do you know what happens with our budgets? Mm -hmm. Where has your budget arrived at in any of these African countries? There are constraints which are dictated by external forces, and you have, your governments have to obey those constraints, or there will be no aid given to them to run their countries. You don't produce enough to run your countries on your own. This is why you have all these aid groups, foreign assistance of all kinds, because you need them to balance your budget. Mm. So because they have the purse string, they can dictate what you do and you don't do. But you are there, the elected president, so long as you are obedient, they'll keep you there to keep doing what they tell you. When you are disobedient, you get into trouble, like Babo in Côte d'Ivoire. He offended the French interests. So they got Ouattara to come in and replace him. Doesn't that such a bad job, has he? I'm not saying who, whether he's done a good job. I'm saying when you offend the, the powers that actually control your so-called independence, that's what gets to happen. Okay. You get booted out, either in a rigged election or by a coup, and a more obedient servant will be brought in to replace you. To the populace, you are their leader, but you are their leader on sufferance to the big powers. The United Nations runs all these countries. The agencies run all our countries because they dictate the policies and make sure you follow them. And they have the post string on you. If you want to be independent, you must produce enough and sell enough to be economically independent. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that independence, whoever lends you the balance of what you need to balance your economy can dictate what you do or don't do. There are those who have said that for us to perhaps get this level, we require one African country to get to what we term a G8 rank of sorts. Is that a possibility you see? Is that the way forward? Well, let's put it this way. If you go back to Marcus Garvey's formulation of the issue, mm -hmm. he was saying that black people in the world cannot be respected in the world by the other races until they do what the other races have done that gave them respect. You can't go and beg for respect. You can't beg for whatever it is because whoever gives you equality can remove it whenever he wants. So if you want the respect of the world, you must develop the appropriate power that gains the respect. Or to put it in a, in a crude way that um, I think it was LBJ who put it, whom's the American way. 
if you build your path to the point where um, you are sitting out there, you are powerful, the guys, the more powerful people will have to reckon with you. Mm. And the logic would be that it's better to have you inside with them pissing out than outside pissing in. And that's what North Korea is doing. They have the nuclear weapons. They are threatening everybody because you are keeping them out. So ultimately, America has to understand that you are going to remove its nuclear weapons, so bring them officially into the nuclear club. So if you want respect, whether it's economic or military respect, you better develop your own capacity. Okay. The, the, there's been talk of an Africa rising over the past five, six years or so. Is that a concept that you buy into, that Africa indeed is rising? Or this is, again, a Western makeup? Where's the evidence that you're rising? Economists are improving. Countries are growing faster. Populations are growing. Well, growth is not development. To go back to that issue, growth is not development. The economies can grow and grow, but they are not developing. You can eat and eat, but if you don't transform it in, into your structures, all you are doing is, you know how much they rip off of, of, of that uh, growth you talk about? How much of it do you retain? How much of it do you plow into your structural integration of your economy? So you can have growth, but if you don't transform it into industrialization and development, you never get to the point where you are a major power in the world. And you wrote a sequel to that book, Decolonizing the African Mind. And you looked at, again, different concepts of colonization. What was left out in the first part that you felt you had to add in the second one? No, no, no. It's not a question of what was left out. It was a question of saying, if you are going to do what you need to do, you have to do some mental house cleaning. Mm. You don't take somebody who is being made crazy and set him out to go and do things that it requires, it requires sanity to do. And part of our problem is that we have not attended to that aspect of our history where we don't understand that we are basically all misbehaving. Some African-American, well, two, two examples. Malcolm X put it in the following way, that he doesn't know of any African-American, no matter who he is, who has not been damaged by the experience of the black people at the hands of the whites. An African-American psychologist put it differently. He says, we're all living in um, what he called pathological normalcy. Mm. That's an interesting way of putting it. Well, it's a very technical but very important. In other words, the average black person looks normal, mm -hmm. but his no normality is pathological. In other words, what is normal for black people is not the same as what is normal for other people. If other people behave that way, they'd be considered crazy. So the normalcy we, we accept in other people's, uh, when compared with other people's, is a version of craziness. So until you get rid of that pathological normalcy, you aren't going to get anywhere. And for you, what do you consider at the moment the greatest threat to Africa moving forward, to us getting a country that is close to this GH rank, where we have the kind of development and proper independence that you are talking about? Well, the threat is everywhere. Most of it is our inability to understand that we have enemies. If you don't understand that you have enemies, you can embrace your greatest enemy, run to him for assistance, and he'll just knife you. <laughs> That's right. So, Marcus Garvey made a point about knowing your enemy is an essential part of being educated. So, most black people, if you ask them, do you have any enemies? They can't see any sign of it. And when you tell them, ah, what of the West? They say, what are you talking about? 
these guys who are development partners, who produce all these things that we buy, who are so nice to us, they brought us civilization, they brought us Christianity, this, that, and that. What are you talking about when you say we have enemies? The fact that they refuse to recognize the essential relationship between us and them. And when, so long as they don't recognize that, they will not behave appropriately. And I'll give you an example. What does the word abrofo mean? White people. That is an incorrect uh, definition. Mm. Yes. The same with Ayevuto, and the same with uh, what's the, the guy equivalent. The point is, when you, analyze, when you break it down etymologically, mm -hmm. what does Abro mean? Let's start from there. Okay, so basically, uh, that's a, there's a negative connotation. I don't know how to explain the word Abro, but basically a cheat, sort of. Well, you're yeah, along the correct lines. All I'm pointing out to you <coughs> is that we've lost the meaning. Your ancestors gave you severe warning so that when you enter into a relationship with certain people, you'll be on the alert. When they coined those names for them, that was the message they were giving you through the language. But over the last, I don't know how long, people have come around to use it just as a label. So they don't reflect about what the message is. If you know that somebody, that, that this is a snake, you don't behave, you have to adapt yourself to a snake behavior. If, if you know that somebody is um, a fox, you, behave, you adapt your behavior to that fact. But if you forget mm. that message about the character, then you'll behave differently. And I'll give you a graphic example. In, in Kwame Nkrumah's time, Ghanaians were importing all kinds of things to help development. The, some Eastern European country supplied uh, what they called um, farm tractors. Okay. Now, when they were brought here, they were found to be snow plows. <laughs> now, you couldn't use them, right? Yeah. Now, one question is, if Ghanaians at that point were aware of the meanings of abrofo and um, all the other terms, they would have shined their eyes so when you, when, when you start making contracts with people, you make sure you check everything along the way. You could have sent uh, pre-shipment inspectors to guarantee that what they were sending you were what was written in the contract, not when they have arrived and they've taken their money. So by forgetting the meanings of our certain words, that's part of our craziness. Okay. I hope you're enjoying the conversation with Chin Wei, so I'm definitely learning a new thing. I'm being schooled on my own language here, <laughs> but I hope we are all being schooled. Now, when we return, we'll talk Nigerian politics and literature. Keep watching Face to Face. Welcome back to Face to Face. And uh, we're having a conversation today with a historian, an academic, a poet, a journalist. And he's telling us about a couple of things. Shinwezu is our guest on Face to Face today. Now, Shinwezu, you come from Nigeria. In two weeks' time, Nigeria goes to the polls to select a president. And first of all, I want to ask about the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria. Has it helped the country? Well, let me start by making a point of correction. I'm not an academic. Okay. I left academy in 1979. Okay. That's 40 years ago. So I'm out of that milieu. Okay. I'm an independent researcher and historian and journalist and all of that. Okay. But then to get to your question about the 1999 Constitution, you guys are lucky. You mean us in Ghana? Yeah. Oh, okay. It's because your government has recently given you a Constitution Day holiday, mm. which hopefully will draw your attention to your Constitution so you know what's in it. In the case of the Nigerian Constitution, 1979 Constitution, it is a piece of fraud. And I'll give you the most obvious. There are several others. The preamble says that we, the people, 
device enacted and gave it to ourselves. That's a total lie. Why? The Constitution was drawn up during the Abacha regime in secret and was promulgated by decree by Abdul Salami Abu Bakr, who replaced Abacha when he died. People were not consulted. It was not submitted for referendum. Niger and most Nigerians don't even know what's in it till today. But the fraud, that was the main fraud. But the other frauds, like another major one is that the Constitution has a, a, a section called Chapter 2, talking about the objectives and fundamental principles of, of state policy. Mm. There's all kinds of lovely things in it. State has to fight corruption, has to provide all kinds of services for the population, blah, blah, blah. But in a clause before that, they had made it impossible for the state to execute, it absolved the state from doing any of those things. But that's a clause somewhere else. And most Nigerians don't even know their constitution, because if they know, they will then discover why their government is providing nothing for them, because it is exempted from doing any of those nice things within that same constitution. So the government does not care, it does not give you security, it does not protect you, because all those responsibilities, it's been absolved from them by a different section of the constitution. So, that, so the fraud of saying that we give it to ourselves is the first one because that's in the preamble. The rest you have to go and dig to find out all the other frauds in it. Like the way it was manipulated to hand power permanently to one part of Nigeria. They divide states and put them all in and local government areas, give them all, put them all in the constitution, but made a preponderance to the House of Fulani North so that they, they will dominate parliament, uh, the National Assembly, so long as that constitution is in place. Then a lot of our problems in Nigeria that, that are traceable to that constitution. As far as I'm concerned, and I've said that somewhere else, it is the, in, is the codification of all the troubles, of the ills that are uh, plaguing Nigeria. It's in that constitution. Okay, and there are a lot of political watchers who say Nigeria has so much potential. Nigeria could be that G8 country that you talk about. Outside of the constitution, what else is drawing Nigeria back? Well, well the constitution is dealing with the latest stage since 1999 of so-called democracy. Now, the history of Nigeria, if you go back to it, you can then see why Nigeria is not going to get in all these hopes that it will be your G8 or whatever. If you know the history of Nigeria, you will just forget it. If why? Ni if Nigeria is the hope of the black world, then the black world has no hope. That, that's a, that's a, a, a very sad thing to hear from you, Jewism. Well, sad but correct, but real. Because the British, when they put Nigeria together, did some very dangerous things for us. They had, at one point, two protectorates. The protectorate of northern Nigeria mm -hmm. and the protectorate of southern Nigeria. This was development by state by state till they got to that point. And in 1914, the British um, colonial secretary sent Frederick Lugard to come and arrange a marriage, these are his own words, between the north and the south. And his concept of it was that he had found a rich bride for the impoverished north. It's all there in the records. And he hoped that the marriage would, would last, would be, you know, fruitful and forthcoming, all the normal cliches about marriages. So what they created was they, they simply took southern Nigeria and added and next it to northern Nigeria. So the domination of Nigeria was started by the British in that form where the north was given a mandate or authorized or crafted to exploit the south. And that has been part of the problem because the north under the Fulani Caliphate has insisted that Nigeria must remain that way. All the others kick against it, but when you do 
there's a Nigerian crisis, which was what happened with, if you recall, M.K. Oabiola's election. He was winning the election, and at that point, the Sultan of Sokote decided to intervene and get this election annulled. So they kept announcing the results up to a certain point, after which they had to stop. And he had orchestrated and organized people who would scuttle it. And when they did, they put Babangida, who was organizing the transition, mm -hmm. in problems because some of the agents of the Sokoto Caliphate of the Sultan made a statement to their generals that if the election results came through, they would shoot both Babangida and Abiola. It's all documented. And Faced with that ultimatum, IDB decided to, to cool it. He wasn't going to risk having himself and um, his friend, MKO, who was winning the election, shot. So the June 12 crisis was, couldn't, didn't get worse because of IDB's, what I call it, cool-headedness in not challenging the Sultan. So basically what I'm telling you is that you have a situation where Nigeria was created as, an, as a territory for the Fulani Caliphate to enjoy itself. And that has, any attempt to change that has been part of the problem. But if you look at the current federal arrangement of Nigeria, does that hold, does that status hold that that part of Nigeria is enjoying itself? Well, all I can tell you is that they have the preponderance of the revenue that come into Nigeria. It doesn't get produced in their part, but it, most of it gets, spent, get, gets sent to them through the mechanisms of that constitution. Because all the states depend on the federal government, so-called federal government, which is simply a central government. All the state governments are like administrative units. They don't have their own constitutions, as would be the case in a real federation. They don't control their resources. The so-called federal government controls everything. You can't develop um, your state if Abuja doesn't want you to, because it's all there in the Constitution. They have what they took out as um, a, a special list that only, you can only federal government can do. Everything else, you must get their permission. So on the surface of it, you have a federation. In practice, you don't. And they've so organized that constitution that even your VAT, most of which is raised in the South, they get their share through the sharing mechanism. So most of the revenue from VAT gets given to the governments in the North. Well, that, what they use it for is something else. Some of it, they, of course, they spend on themselves, on uh, whatever, wherever they and to fund Boko Haram. That's a, a, a pretty serious uh, uh, link to draw? Well, again, it's a matter of knowing the history. Boko Haram was a tiny organization until the caliphate agents picked it up, gave it the resources and the linkages abroad to become what it became. And I'm not talking, the, the, the exposure came from one of the caliphate big, big wigs who was number two in the caliphate structure, the emir of Gwandu at the time, who had been in the military. And when he became emir of Gwandu, they all, for some quarrel they had, well, his first annoyance was that under Abbasanjo's regime, um, the North was not getting what it was used to getting. Mm. Because one of the first things Abbasanjo did to protect his regime was to fire all those Northern generals. So this was one of their grievances. So at a meeting of the Caliphate Emirs, um, Major Jokolo, who had been ADC to Buhari when he was military head of state, urged them that it was time to do a jihad against Obasanjo, that they were being marginalized. This, they don't get the contracts they used to get. They don't have the banks they used to control. And their sons have been purged from the, arm, from the military. 
he made that statement in public, so it was reported. So they took, they took effective, they went and implemented what he said, but deposed him, so they would not be officially linked to what they were going to do. So they picked up Boko Haram and groomed it to use it to get back control of the Fed, Fed of Nigerian government. Oh, okay. That, I hope you are picking up some interesting uh, uh, tips from uh, our chat with Sinwezu. And we'll be going for a break, but before we go, I must ask you, mm -hmm. you look at PDP, APC, the two major parties mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. How do you see them with the election coming up? Atiku versus Buhari. Well, the first thing you've got to recognize is that both parties are caliphate parties. The membership, most of those who are now in APC were PDP governors and whatever else mm. who crossed over. Some of them have crossed back over back to PDP. The point is both parties those are the two major parties, and they have been controlled by, they are loyal to the caliphate, and the, the membership from the carpet crossing isn't different. So you have two caliphate candidates running for election, heading the two principal parties. All right, then. We'll go for another commercial break. When we come back, Shinwezu will give us more information on how the Nigerian election is expected to go. Keep watching face to face. Welcome back to Face to Face. And before we went, Sinwezu was taking us through the upcoming Nigerian elections. We're looking at APC and uh, PDP at, uh, Atiku versus Buhari. Buhari is the incumbent, but it does not look like he's the favorite for the election. What's happening? Well, favorite in what sense? Favorite to win. Well, I'll give you a statement, a comment by his... Um, Special Assistance for Media and Publicity. Leaders from the various zones of Nigeria, Nigeria is supposed to be divided into six geopolitical zones, mm. southwest, south-south, southeast, north-central, northeast, and northwest. Now, the leaders from these zones went and endorsed uh, Atiku. And Buhari's media spokesman's response was, all these people can endorse Atiku. Witches and wizards may do so if they choose, but the harder they come, the harder they fall. Those were his words. Those were his words. What does that mean? Well, if you've already rigged the election, it doesn't matter who endorses who. You think that Buhari has rigged the election? The evidence is abundant. Where? The INEC, which is supposed to be Independent National Electoral Commission, is not independent. It is not national. Its job is not, elect elect it's not an electoral job. It's packed it with its cronies to the point where at the INEC headquarters, he's made his niece the collating officer. There's no conflict of interest, apparently in his mind. The judicial process for appeals is under his control. So if they announce whatever they announce, and this, is, this has happened in other elections, and the politicians go to court, he's made sure that he has simply removed the sitting chief justice and put another one who is a northern Muslim and loyal to him, to his agenda. So basically, the security agencies who are supposed to monitor the election are all under his con personal Muslim control. The army, the navy, I think the navy is the only one he didn't put on his control. The air force, the uh, police, the there are several other, customs, ports, all these 
uniformed agencies of government. When he came in, the, the, the state security, Department mm -hmm. of State Security, inter military intelligence, all of that, he, he brought in his own people, Muslims from the north, not even Muslims from the south, from the south, to man all those positions. So the entire security apparatus is in his control. The um, Electoral Commission is in his control. And from the previous other elections in Nigeria, they will announce whatever they like. If you don't like it, you go to the courts and it's guaranteed you will lose. Because the Chief Justice has just been changed. Not just, well, the, the, the entire structure of uh, the appeals courts has been changing, changing them in, in, since he came in. And reportedly retiring um, Christian and non-Northern and non-Muslim officers and bringing in Muslim officers who are committed to his agenda. So basically from where you said, we should expect a Buhari victory. An announcement of a Buhari victory as the official result. Interesting. And post that, because Nigeria is also not known for being calm when it comes to accepting these kind of results. Well, the only clue I can give you to that, what will happen after that, uh, on two sides. One, uh, you must be aware of the ethnic cleansing that's been going on in the central Nigeria. Ethnic cleansing, we are aware of clashes between headsmen and farmers. That's the official story. The same story you heard in, about the Janja weed in Sudan. But the reality is that the so-called um, herdsmen are armed with AK-47s, attacking herdsmen who have no protection, who have no arms. The herdsmen used to carry their machetes and sticks like any cow herds normally do. But for the last 15 or 20 years in Nigeria, they've been armed with um, AK-47s. They go into people's farms, graze them. When people protest, they kill them. And I guess the most famous example, or notorious example of that was the guy who ran against a passenger in 1999, who used to be secretary to the federal government. They've attacked his farm like five times. This Yoruba from the southwest, they've attacked his farm like five, five times. And the question is, why are the security agencies not stopping these fellows? The U.S. Embassy had, had to come out, came out with a statement, I think it was last year, that there was an atmosphere of impunity in mm -hmm. Nigeria, and that when nobody is punished for these things, they keep happening. But the reality behind that is even worse, that these so-called Fulani herdsmen are supported and assisted by the military. And the accusation was made public by General Dan Juma, who used to be chief of army staff in the 1960s, and who was a passenger's minister of defense. He's from the Middle Belt, and he point, one of his graphic statements was that these guys are protecting and complicit in the massacres and ethnic cleansing, and you better start, people should start defending themselves. If they are waiting for the government to protect them, they will all die. If you are waiting for the government to protect you, you will all die. This from a former Minister of Defense, a former Chief of Army Staff, advising Nigerians to seek their own self-protection because the government is not going to protect them. But the question is, why is the government not protecting them? Okay, that's, that's, that's a big question that we will leave for the Nigerian elections. But as we move on, we are getting into the final phases of our interview. I wanted to ask you about, a bit about literature, because you're also a noted literary critic. And there is a new African literature, so to say, coming in with authors like Chimimanda from Nigeria, Tai Salasi, Yajesi, uh, what do you make of this resurgence of African literature? Well, I lost interest in African literature many years ago. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm from, yeah, it's, it's like asking 
the dead to comment on what's <laughs> happening in literature now because in 19, I think in 1988, I brought out an anthology called Voices from 20th Century Africa. Mm-hmm. And from after that point, you stopped paying attention. attention because most of what I was reading at the time did not impress me. Impress you how? Well, I have a, I have an, I have a peculiar, you may want to call it, way of assessing works of literature. If I go into a bookstore, I pick any book at random, start on any page, start reading. If I don't keep turning the pages, I drop it. Why? Just capture my interest. They are not African enough for you? They, if you are not a good storyteller, I don't care whether you are African or not, you can't keep my interest. And at that point, I drop you. Because I'm not obliged, I'm not an academic who has to teach it and therefore has to suffer through it. I read for my pleasure. Mm. So if I go and your work doesn't capture my interest, why should I waste my time on it? Okay. But another work of yours that caught my attention, and because of the period in which we find ourselves, was a book you wrote called Anatomy of Female Power, A Masculinist Dissection of Matriarchy. And in it, you dealt with gender relations at a time when a lot of Africans had not really written about the topic and you looked at in it you opined that women held a certain kind of power is that a position you still hold in lieu of the era that we live in now well i'll be very brief because that's not a, a, an issue that to me is very important at this point in our history mm. the point is there's a delusion that women do not have any power. The point is to go and examine the actual power they wield and have wielded all through history and compare it with the rhetoric. And what that book did was to make that exploration and to show the areas in which, through which they control even those who have official power. So that's all I think I should say about that. Okay. And I hear you have a lecture coming up at the University of Ghana. What's it about? Well, that's where I'm wearing my historian's cap. <laughs> the title is 432 Centuries of Recorded Science and Technology in Black Africa. 432 Centuries of Recorded Science and Technology in Black Africa. Exactly. Why that particular theme? Well, you have to correct misconceptions that are part of our problem. Do you care to share some of the things you'll be discussing? Well, most black people think that science and technology are white people's things because they they bring us all (laughs) these modern technology that we know about. Mm -hmm. And the point is, you will not have the confidence to build your own if you, don't, if you don't know that you were able to do certain things in the past. So for us to get that confidence, we have to go back to our history of science and technology and find out what we did so that we can decide if we want to do it again. If our ancestors could do it, why can't you? So it's a matter of our confidence in ourselves when it comes to our areas of science and technology to make sure that we lose our inferiority complex by knowing our history. So that's... And where is this happening? It's at the um, University of Ghana, Legon, mm-hmm. in the Physics Department at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, next Tuesday, in the Lower Lecture Theatre. So that's where that will take place. And uh, before I end the interview, I came upon one of your quotes and it struck me. What kind of people we become depends crucially on the stories we are nurtured on. Care to explain? Well, character building starts from stories. If you hear certain kinds of stories and they are drummed into you, they shape how you look at the world. If you grew up when you are an impressionable infant and you are given a certain cosmology that says, um, 
or you can take the Christian or the Muslim cosmology with their monotheism. Or if you are given an African cosmology with its polytheism, polytheism in, in, encourages tolerance. Monotheism is very intolerant. So people who are monotheistically brought up tend to be totally intolerant. And the worst example of it today are the jihadists. They don't tolerate anything other than what's in the Quran and in the Hadith. If anything goes against that, their mission is to destroy it and, and impose Islamic culture on the whole world. Now, how are you going to accommodate and live together with such people if you believe that let's have to, um, multicultural whatever society? So that's just a cardinal example of where what you are taught in infancy determines you won't go on jihad if you were not brought, given that mentality that it is your God-ordained mission to kill all the infidels. Infidel meaning those who don't believe in what you believe. It's a very intolerant approach to life. And you imbibe it in Quranic school or, or whatever. All right. Then. Thank you very much, Chin Wezu. It's been a great pleasure. I've learned a lot, and I'm sure my viewers have also learned a lot from this particular interaction. We'll try and bring Chiwezu back again. He has a lot of insight to so many parts of our history. My name is Godfrey Akutobuafo. It's been a pleasure.